By the fall of 1965, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band was becoming known as one of the most exciting new groups in pop music. Their appearance at Newport had created a critical buzz, and the release of Born in Chicago on an electric compendium had caught the ears of college students around the country. With Michael and the band, the Butterfield Band added a new dimension to its brand of Chicago blues. Masterful solos, largely from Paul and Michael, but also from other band members, were the rule. Audiences were amazed by the group's loud, aggressive virtuosity. The band's first record came out on Electra in October. The Butterfield Band began a life on the road in the fall of 1965. They traveled from New York to Boston, west to Detroit and Chicago, then back to Boston, performing at small clubs and coffee houses for a few weeks at a time. Playing two and three sets a night, setting up and breaking down their own equipment, and hustling from gig to gig in the band's cramped van helped turn Butterfield's men into seasoned professionals. It also helped to consolidate the band's sound. And one night during a stopover in Boston, Mike Bloomfield found a guitar that changed his sound. Developed by famed jazz guitarist and inventor Les Paul, the gold-topped instrument that bore his name was a dense wooden slab with an overdriven and often distorted sound. Its sustain and punch made the guitar a favorite among many of Chicago's blues masters. Michael Bloomfield immediately made good use of it. At the end of 1965, the Butterfield Band traveled to California, playing gigs at first in Los Angeles. They opened at the famed Whiskey A Go Go in January. The club's buttoned down patrons, used to the choreographed sounds of Sam and Dave and Johnny Rivers, didn't know what to make of Butterfield. Not only did they perform uncompromising, hard edged electric blues, but they were an integrated band and they played extended solos and long, jazzy instrumentals. Instrumentals like Mike Bloomfield's East West. Things changed in March. The Butterfield Band was hired to do a weekend gig in San Francisco by two promoters named John Carpenter and Chet Helms. The show was to be held at a rundown dance hall called the Fillmore Auditorium. John Carpenter and I, under the name Family Dog, were the first people to book the Butterfield Blues Band on the West Coast, and uh, we uh, paid more for them than we <laughs> could even imagine at that moment, which I don't think it was all that great. I think it was something like 2500 bucks for the weekend or something, but that was seemed astronomical to us. The hall was leased by a no-nonsense ex-New Yorker named Bill Graham. He was immediately impressed by the Butterfield Band, in no small part because the group sold out the auditorium all three nights. San Francisco would become the band's second home. Shake your body, baby. Shake your body, baby. 
Meanwhile, manager Albert Grossman was doing all he could to promote his young protege. Norman Paris and his group are playing the introduction of Born in Chicago. Including booking Paul on To Tell the Truth, the day after the band's Fillmore debut. Paul Butterfield, please give us some blues. The Paul Butterfield Blues Band continued to tour when they weren't in San Francisco. They crisscrossed the country, playing in Chicago, Detroit, New York, Boston, and other cities along the way. <laughs> Audiences thrilled to the two-guitar sound created by Bloomfield and rhythm guitarist Elvin Bishop, something unique in pop music at the time. And under Michael's influence, Elvin quickly became a fine soloist himself. But Michael Bloomfield remained the de facto star of the Butterfield Band, playing ever more adventurous and dazzling solos night after night in town after town. In the summer of 1966, the Butterfield Band spent a number of weeks in New York City, playing at the Café Agogo. They stayed at the Albert Hotel. Down the street at the Café Wa, a guitarist from Seattle was playing. Bloomfield's friend John Hammond told Michael to go see him. <laughs> Calling himself Jimmy James, the guitarist was not only a superb player, but he was also a master of distortion and feedback. Bloomfield was stunned. For the first time in his career, he'd encountered a guitarist who was his equal. And within a year, Jimi Hendrix would stun the music world too. In August of 1966, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band released its second album entitled East West. The record was an amalgam of influences. Drawing from pop, jazz, rock, and Eastern influences, East West showed how far the band had moved from its Chicago blues roots. Two showpieces on the record, a jazz blues called Work Song and the title track, an original by Mike Bloomfield, seemed to merge all musical streams, East and West. While the record wasn't a huge hit, it quickly became essential listening for serious rock and blues musicians everywhere. Bloomfield's solo on East West charted new territory, and extended jams became the rule for many bands. Their reputation had grown, and they were now regarded as the best blues band in America. Michael Bloomfield was considered the finest electric guitarist on the American scene. The time seemed right to test the Butterfield Band's appeal abroad. Albert Grossman arranged a tour for the group in England. I say goodbye, no love, and that's why you break down. I won't cry. You're educated, half frustrated, try to make the best. It's too late. What time's enough to make up your mind? Playing with borrowed equipment, the band spent four weeks in October and November playing gigs in and around London. The press was enthusiastic, public response was mixed, and the tour was a difficult one. It, it, was, it 
it was rough because uh, we was with a show, and uh, except for the last few days, uh, with a show, you know, uh, Georgia Fane and somebody else, Garrett Burton, and uh, we didn't have but 15 minutes on the stage, so we really couldn't play East West until we got in, the, did a couple clubs. But it, it was rough because, like I say, we was on the bus. Uh, they, they couldn't get with the amps that they gave, you know. So they sent for the road manager. The road man, manager came over. And uh, when Eric uh, Clapton came over to New York, we were the first person that he came down to see. Michael Bloomfield had heard Eric Clapton's playing on a John Mayall record and very much admired the British guitarist blues sound. The two had a chance to meet during a gig in Leeds, and Michael noted that Eric, who was by then playing with Cream, was using a Les Paul sunburst, 